In April 1999, during a two-week rampage, 22-year-old David Copeland embarked on a murderous campaign to maim and kill on the streets of London. Until we caught him, London was always going to be at risk. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. The effect of the explosion would be even more devastating than the other two attacks. And with it, the question, why did someone so young wage a killing spree against the capital? When a second device goes off almost exactly a week later, then you do quickly start thinking, is there a link? Because he fundamentally hated anybody who wasn't him, he wouldn't run out of victims to target. Using the killer's own words. Could you please explain to me, when you made these devices, what your intent was? We find out why. Murder, mayhem, chaos, damage given the news. Top story, right? Really. A vast sprawling area covering approximately 670 square miles of southeast England, London is home to over 8 million people from all over the globe. With a diverse mix of cultures, religion and wealth spread throughout a network of districts, this vibrant city is continuously alive to the hum of its inhabitants. But during the afternoon of the 30th of April, 1999, the buzz of London's lively Soho district was about to be silenced. As another busy week came to an end, workers had begun to descend on the many bars and clubs the popular area had to offer, celebrating the start of the weekend. It was actually quite quiet that evening for a Friday night because it was very sunny outside and very warm for the first time that year. A popular place to unwind was one of Soho's oldest pubs, the Admiral Duncan. It was a very long, narrow pub, uh, low ceiling, wood panelling. It reminded me of like a Cornish smugglers pub down on the coast. The Admiral Duncan on Old Compton Street had been trading since the early 19th century. In recent years, it had become a popular gay bar. Small and intimate, it was known for its friendly and welcoming atmosphere and would often fill up with drinkers early on a Friday afternoon. I was later than I normally would have been for a Friday night and um, I was meeting two friends. There was quite a few people who were drinking after work, a um, few people in suits. Um, there was people who were on their way to the theatre, having a pre-theatre drink there, so uh, a very mixed bag. But on this afternoon, the clientele were unaware that only minutes earlier, an individual had been drinking amongst them, whose sole intention was to cause enormous harm to everyone there. Six thirty five PM. Inside the Admiral Duncan, a black bag lay at the feet of those drinking at the bar. It had been placed approximately twenty minutes earlier. I actually stood right at the back of the pub, which was my usual sort of bolt hole, um, just beside the jukebox. And Robbie Williams Millennium that had just started. It only lasted for about six or seven bars when the bomb exploded. I didn't actually hear a, um, a loud bang, just a blue flash, and then an odd sort of noise as if kind of like um, cabling was being ripped out of the ceiling. Within a matter of minutes, the upbeat, happy atmosphere had been torn apart, replaced by a bloody scene of carnage. As I got here to the junction of Tisbury Court, I looked straight down and I could see smoke billowing towards me. Photographer Chris Taylor was only streets away when the explosion happened and managed to capture images of the immediate aftermath. While I originally thought it was a big fire, 
Um, I realized that it was an explosion because people were panicked so much. Now I could start seeing devastation and what was happening. Not that I could see bodies, everybody was moving. I could see, but I could see some horrific injuries. And if these were the people that were outside, I just could only imagine what had happened inside and how bad it was. The first thing I knew was um, it was pitch black. There was smoke swirling around, strong smell of sulphur. The bomb inside the black bag had been packed with hundreds of nails, which had ripped through the small space. The smoke was so thick, you couldn't even see the street, even though it was sunny outside. And I can remember thinking, I might not see my parents again. I can remember, as, as I wandered up the street, how eerily quiet it was. But the closer I got, there were some people shouting and screaming and people asking for help. One of the first on the scene to attend to the injured was medic Andy Wapling. There was glass, there was, there was rubble, there was wood, there was people. There were, were people mixed in amongst that debris. And I turned to what was the Admiral Duncan, and it was a black hole. Three people were killed by the explosion, including a woman who was four months pregnant at the time. Four lost limbs, and 70 others were injured. The bomb left to detonate inside the Admiral Duncan pub had been the third explosion in a series of similar blasts across London over the past two weeks. The devices were all made exactly the same. The explosives, the nails, the plastic box, uh, the holdle, uh, the timing mechanism of the clock, it's all exactly the same. In a hotel room just a few miles away, the man responsible for building and planting all three bombs turned on the TV. 22-year-old David Copeland watched as the news channels reported live on the chaos caused by his devastating spree. Because he fundamentally hated anybody who wasn't him, he wouldn't run out of victims to target and he would keep going until he got caught. During two weeks in April 1999, London's emergency services were put to the test as a ruthless spree killer sent a wave of terror through the nation's capital. Three massive explosions in three different locations ripped through the city's streets, injuring over a hundred people and tragically killing three others. The devastating bombs were the work of just one man, 22-year-old David Copeland. But why had someone so young masterminded such a ruthless killing spree, designed to kill and maim, spreading fear and panic across London. Could you tell me, please, why? I knew that people would be hurt, people would be killed, but I had to do it. I just wanted to leave my mind. I just had to do it. It's my destiny. On the 15th of May, 1976, David Copeland was born in the West London suburb of Hanworth. The middle child of three brothers, he was noticeably different from his siblings, being significantly smaller than both, causing an early inferiority complex. He wasn't very outgoing, he was shy and withdrawn sometimes, so he felt massively inadequate relative to everybody else. From the age of about 12, he'd begun to have dreams uh, of violence. He apparently dreamt of killing his schoolmates. He also dreamt of coming back reincarnated as an SS officer. And it seems to have, there seems to have been a strain of violence that was running through him like a sort of submerged river, never quite bubbling to the top. We do know that nobody at the school had any memory of him at all. He made absolutely no impression on the school or on the staff. I think it's possibly safe to say that because he was such a, a nondescript individual who didn't stand out in any way to his peers and his teachers, perhaps that's a sign that he was uh, truly a blank slate. Still small in stature and with few friends to protect him, Copeland remained a shy and reclusive student. 
marking him out for bullying. With no one to confide in, his festering inner thoughts remained largely undiscovered. He was an individual who didn't explode and erupt that other people could see, but he harboured that resentment and anger and that fueled his fantasies to the extreme direction they took. The 17th of April, 1999, 11 a.m. Farnborough, Hampshire. Seven hours before the deadly spree began, in his bedsit, 22-year-old David Copeland completed the final stages in the construction of a four-inch pipe bomb. Up to 1,500 hours had been put in the bomb, turning it into a, a lethal concoction. What did that mean to you, for putting needles in the bomb? It made it smash windows out, stick into people, pain people, kill people. With the target in mind and the device fully prepared, Copeland placed it in a black bag and cycled the mile and a half to Farnborough Station. There he boarded the first train to London. 3 p.m. Having arrived at Clapham Junction, Copeland hailed a taxi and headed to his intended target, the district of Brixton. So this is where David Copeland first arrived by taxi and after being dropped off, he decides where he's going to go and then he walks off in the area over here. Brixton uh, Market on a Saturday afternoon is busy, lots of people there. It's also a main thoroughfare going into central London. Copeland spent some time in the area looking for the perfect spot in which to plant his deadly weapon. His intention, to create maximum carnage. The timer was set for 5.25 p.m. This would mark the beginning of a killing spree that he hoped would spread fear and panic across the city of London. And the bit you have to keep emphasising is that it's over his back and it's armed and it's ready to explode. 4.50 p.m. With the bomb armed, Copeland placed the bag outside a supermarket. As the countdown began, he left the scene, buoyed by the impending devastation that was about to be unleashed. So after Copeland had left the uh, device in the bag here, he walks off. The bag is now here for some minutes. But Copeland hadn't accounted for the inquisitive nature of those walking by the unattended bag. Someone came along probably not concerned there was anything dangerous in the bag, but probably hopeful there was something valuable in the bag. And so they moved in. They cross over Electric Avenue. Still got the bag. And he puts the bag down here. A number of passing people saw the bag and investigated it. In fact, at one point, someone took the bomb out of the bag and put it down. The lethal weapon was now located amongst some packing materials on the side of the street. So sitting on the pallet now is a plastic box containing explosives, batteries, a clock and um, large quantity of nails. It wouldn't have been clear to those passing by that the mystery package was in fact a live bomb, so many of the shoppers and stallholders remained in the area. Behind me um, was a big skip with rubbish and other uh, objects that were near it. The people that have found it are sort of almost hiding behind the skip, calling to each other. Some are coming to look at it, some don't know what to do, and they're trying to get a degree of shelter behind the skip. At 5.25pm, almost 40 minutes after the bag was left outside the store, the bomb exploded. The nails ripped through the flimsy market stalls, hitting everyone in the immediate vicinity. There's a van up here. The door of it gets blown partly off of its hinges. A car is just driving past the device over there, and that also gets caught in the blast. Although the explosive itself wasn't huge, the fact that there were nails and shrapnel, which, which goes and travels a great distance at, at great speed, is what does the damage. The first numbers started saying that there were 30-plus uh, people injured. It went up to maybe 50. 
Although no one had been killed, 48 were injured in the blast. As police began to assess the aftermath, fragments of the device were quickly recovered. When a bomb goes off, it doesn't destroy itself. So recovered from the scene then was parts of the uh, timing device, which we knew then to be uh, a clock, and uh, chemical tests that we knew that it was a, a flash powder consistent with coming from fireworks, that you can start building up the picture of how the device was made before it went off. The bomb itself was clearly designed to kill and maim as many people as possible. It was not a sophisticated device, but you don't need to have a sophisticated device to kill people. With little prior knowledge of explosives, Copeland had taught himself how to build the devices through the internet using everyday items bought locally. The black powder um, was bought from firework shops. And in fact, on one occasion, he had so many fireworks that he had to uh, order a taxi to take him home to his bedsit. He had experimented um, to make sure that the bombs would work. He apparently experimented in his bedsit. He also set off one of the bombs on a common nearby just to see that the thing would work. Weeks of planning and preparation had paid off. The device had had the desired effect, and for now, Copeland had got away with it. We had no intelligence, no information. My thoughts went straight to, well, who was it likely to be? And my biggest fear was what it turned out to be, a criminal lunatic with no real history in our world, certainly not in this sort of territory. Several years before planting that horrific first bomb in Brixton Market, a teenage David Copeland had become increasingly isolated from those around him. At school, he failed to form any lasting relationships, preferring to spend his time as an invisible pupil, left to his own devices. Few would ever take any notice of him. At the age of 17 or 18, he was drinking and uh, taking drugs drifting through jobs. He didn't have a lasting relationship. He used prostitutes. Life, by um, his view, was tough. By late 1995, an increasingly isolated Copeland was getting out of control. His drinking had increased, and he started to take a variety of drugs, including cocaine, crack, and heroin. Unable to commit, Copeland drifted from job to job. Each new job he failed at strengthened a twisted sense of resentment towards the immigrant communities who he believed were stealing the best positions. I think the British people have the right to the You know, the British people didn't ask these people over. They were brought over for the main reason is cheap labour. And then every white man now and woman has to work for cheap labour. He's floundering at life while his friends people who don't deserve to be as happy as him are clearly doing much better. The 18th of April, 1999, in the immediate aftermath of the explosion that had ripped through the busy Brixton market, police had begun a massive hunt to catch whoever had planned and prepared the device. People were clearly scared, but unsure of exactly what this was. The pressure on the service to catch the right person as quickly as possible is hard to describe. It was immense and it was intense. Police today were maintaining a high profile in Brixton, asking anyone who may have been in the area on Saturday if they saw anything suspicious. Electric Avenue and Brixton are flooded with police officers who have a questionnaire, were you here, did you see anything, um, to try and jog people's memories. This guy clearly had been around for a bit, he must have been to work out where he was going to place the bomb. He may well have made visits beforehand, uh, and we may well have him captured on CCTV. This borough had one of the best CCTV monitoring systems uh, in London. There were 26 cameras operating on that afternoon in the Brixton area. They set up teams of police officers to go through the CCTV on a 24-hour basis, continuously. Throughout the week, the police investigation crawled forward as specialist officers painstakingly reviewed several hundred hours of recovered CCTV footage. 
tapes in those days, it was physically recovering cassette tapes rather than relying on computer hard drives. So it was a big piece of work and a very big investigative line of inquiry. Eventually, a breakthrough was made. What emerged five days later, on the 23rd, was a very blurred image, which would eventually prove crucial. They spotted someone coming out of a tube station, going into a tube station with a bag, without a bag. It was an opportunity that clearly could be developed. The captured CCTV image, although not conclusive, was a major breakthrough for the investigation. Hopes were high for an imminent arrest and an end to the bloody carnage on London's streets. Just two days later, those hopes were dashed. On the 17th of April, 1999, at 5.25 p.m., a bomb exploded, ripping through a busy Saturday market in Brixton, London. 48 were injured, but fortunately, no one lost their lives. An investigation swung into action, and after hours of trawling through recovered CCTV footage, a blurred image of a potential suspect was discovered. However, despite this apparent breakthrough, the perpetrator remained one step ahead of the police and was already planning the second act of his ruthless spree. The 24th of April, 1999, 3.10 p.m. Farnborough, Hampshire. Just one week after the Brixton bomb, David Copeland put the finishing touches to another explosive device. He then embarked on the now familiar 40-mile journey to the centre of London. This time, the target was Brick Lane. With a largely Asian population, this vibrant part of East London is generally packed with people going about their daily lives. The community here at that time, mostly it were Bengali people. Brick Lane is a, a market, if you like, similar to uh, Electric Avenue, and it would have been full of um, market traders. Uh, it would have been packed with people out doing similar shopping. Wearing identical clothes to the day of the Brixton attack, Copeland arrived in Brick Lane, but immediately realised something was wrong. The normally bustling streets were unusually quiet. Saturday is the quietest day of the whole week, because uh, a lot of the shops uh, don't open on Saturdays. Sunday we are busy. Sunday is the market day. Undeterred by his error, and with a bomb set to explode in a matter of hours, Copeland decided to go ahead with his plan, intent on continuing his spree. Could he have taken the device away and come back another day? Yes, uh, he could have done, but he decided to leave it armed, put it between two vehicles um, outside of a restaurant um, just to see um, what injury or damage it caused. Copeland's pattern of behaviour in planting his bombs was very simplistic. He wasn't interested in anything fancy or anything to show off his abilities. He just wanted to make as many victims as he could. The bomb had been left in Hanbury Street, about two-thirds of the way down Brick Lane, between two vans. It, again, it was in a sports bag. Somebody, a man, picked it up and wondered what it was. For a second time, Copeland had not counted on the inquisitive nature of the general public. The guy who found the bag carried it um, two or three hundred metres to his car, put it in the boot of his car, opened it thinking he'd found some tools, looked in, and with the publicity and his own belief, he then thought, has he got a bomb in a bag in his car? Discovering the police station closed, the man left the bag in the boot of the car and went to alert the authorities. 5.54 p.m., metres away from the parked car, Local resident, Makim Ahmed, had just left his restaurant. I was renovating my restaurant upstairs. And my daughter was with my wife, so she wanted to go shopping. So she said, she rang me up and said, look, I'm coming over to keep uh, Monique with you so that I can go out shopping. So I walked down the stairs, crossed over to the other side of the room, right? 
And as my wife was handing my daughter over to me, that's when it all happened. The sound was so horrendous, so big, I must have turned around to see what it was. But then for split seconds, I thought it, it must be an earthquake, because I fell down with my daughter, but I clung on to my daughter. And uh, then I realized uh, that it was a bomb, and I could see the bonnet of the car flying up in the air. As with the first bomb, this second device had been packed with nails. Injured a number of uh, passers-by and damaged a number of shops but it had none of the disruptive power that the first bomb had had. It was a big sound, it's a blast. It must have been heard miles. You know, the blast was very big. You know, uh, how can I describe it? It's an awful sound, a deafening sound, but it all spent, uh, happened in split seconds. I remember driving into Brick Lane and you could see the smoke. There was a, a mistiness, a fogginess around the street where the, the, the smoke was lingering. There was uh, confusion in the street, people crying, shouting, screaming, you know. And uh, I, I can tell you that the nails travelled about at least 100, 200 feet right up uh, behind us. You could see the nails, big nails. So there wasn't the level of um, casualties that we'd seen in Brixton the previous week, fairly superficial injuries. Police didn't know what has happened, nobody knew uh, what really has happened, you see. Why it has happened, nobody knew. We were all frightened, we were all worried. So there was a real anxiousness about this. You could feel it, you could sense it, that actually we were, we were not out of the woods. This was a second attempt now. Uh, this was somebody very clearly uh, on an agenda. The second explosion, to some extent, of course, gives you more investigative leads to go on, more witnesses to interview more, another forensic scene to recover, but it also creates more confusion and complexity. In the space of just seven days, two similar bombs had exploded in two separate minority communities of London. Although no one had been killed, another 13 people had been injured in the Brick Lane blast, bringing the total to 61. Initially, the thought was, uh, in regards to Electric Avenue, was it terrorism? Was it um, extremism? Was it racism? When a second device goes off almost exactly a week later, then you do quickly start thinking, is there a link, is there a chain, and is there a connection? They'd had an attack on a black area and now an attack on an Asian area. So the assumption had to be that they were dealing with somebody who would strike again. So your aim was more than just to plant bombs and hurt people? That's right, my aim was political, it was to cause a racial war in this country. Two years earlier, in the late spring of 1997, David Copeland, now 20 years old, had finally managed to secure a solid job as an engineer's assistant with the London Underground. The job paid well, but the work had meant moving from the comfort of his family home in Yateley to a shabby, basic bedsit in the mixed-race community of Newham. Here, Copeland's increasingly racist views boiled over. He began to take interest in political groups. He started off with the British National Party. For the first time, Copeland finds a group of people who are like-minded to him. They share very similar extreme views. And we know that support groups, like-minded individuals with extreme views, can be very seductive. It can be a very strong reinforcer. Whilst attending meetings and activities for the BNP, Copeland became exposed to increasing amounts of far-right literature, including the Terrorist Handbook and the Turner Diaries. The Turner Diaries was an American novel written by a white extremist, a supremacist, and it told about the main characters and protagonists, how they plant bombs and start race wars, and eventually uh, the white race becomes supreme. But I am a Nazi, I admit that. Yeah, I believe in what I believe in. Well, what do you believe in, Tom? National Socialist State. What does that mean? Well, it means the Aryan domination of the world. White races, the master race. 
Copeland's abhorrent racist views became increasingly affected by what he read, how the literature served to shape his impressionable mind with ever more radical views. He was able to develop the know-how to build very rudimentary but effective time device bombs, and this he began doing in his bedroom. By 1998, Copeland had become disillusioned and frustrated by the BNP. They were neither active enough for his liking, nor were they extreme enough. And so he went to smaller groups that were more extreme. Copeland very quickly joins another extreme group, the National Socialist Movement. And this was an underground group of right-wing extremists and white supremacists who believed that action and terrorism was the way to succeed with their political views. Here, Copeland is said to have flourished with the like-minded members. And before long, he had made inquiries with his superiors at the party about progressing through the ranks. Copeland's involvement was possibly the first time in his adult life that he'd been successful at something. On February the 25th, 1999, Copeland received a letter from the NSM. He had been promoted to unit leader for Hampshire and Wiltshire. So he moved from group to group, becoming more extreme, lesser known, but perhaps more dangerous groups. And he still wasn't satisfied. He took the decision to go it alone. He was essentially a loner. Although he'd achieved a modicum of success in his views and membership of the extreme parties, he wasn't naturally a sociable person. He wasn't a team player. And he felt the need, possibly out of a need for security, to fall back to being a lone wolf operative. Just seven weeks after receiving his promotion within the National Socialist Movement, Copeland would embark on his spree, planting the first bomb that exploded through Brixton Market. He built the bombs alone, he formed his plans alone, he went out alone, and he did the damage alone. Thursday the 29th of April, Scotland Yard, London. 12 days after the first bomb exploded at Brixton Market, extensive work had been continuing on recovered CCTV footage. The quality is pretty poor, and one of the best bits that we were slow to identify is on the Iceland camera that uh, records people going into the shop is where we get one of the best shots of uh, um, the suspect. On the 29th of April, the best photos available, and there were eight in all, were released to the media to see if he could be identified by anyone who knew him. Police believed this was their man, a lone bomber attacking the minority communities of London. But they were still missing a motive for the attacks and were unsure if he was going to strike again. One could feel the sense of urgency and the pressure we were under to get the right conclusion as quickly as we could. Jack Straw, who was then the Home Secretary, made a public appeal urging people to stay calm, urging them uh, to be cautious, and of course the police were urging everybody to be uh, extra vigilant. I think we all got worried by this. You know, we thought some people are trying to get us. We all got together because we were all frightened of what was happening. The concern and the fear was palpable an entirely natural reaction to such an unpredictable and vicious assault on a completely innocent group of people simply going about their business. It's how terror works. During later interviews, police would get to understand just how warped Copeland's motives really were by that stage. Your intent was to really to harm as many people as you can? And my intent was to spread fear, resentment and hatred throughout this country. Friday the 30th of April, 10 a.m. The day after police released CCTV images to the media, David Copeland woke in a London hotel room. Having seen his image dominating the headlines and news bulletins, he knew his time was running out and had spent the night hurriedly preparing a third bomb. He possibly knew from the very first bomb that he planted that his days of bomb planting would be finite and limited which explains why he tried to do as much as he could in as short time as possible. Meanwhile, the response from the released images had an almost immediate effect, and calls came flooding in. You could be overwhelmed with calls from members of the public trying to be really helpful. 
as a consequence, within a very large number of people, there is the perpetrator. One man, a cabbie, thought that he'd taken an individual who looked very much like the suspect in the picture to Brick Lane from Waterloo. So the police began to look at CCTV at Waterloo to see if there was any sort of match. The lead proved positive, and a match was made with the Brixton CCTV footage. In both, he wore the same clothes and carried a similar distinctive black bag. You have to understand that 500 calls are being received that are also identifying um, other suspects, and none of the suspects uh, are identified twice. Late that afternoon, police received another break. And it's not until at about 5.25 that a phone call comes in that gives a name to the suspect. One of David Copeland's workmates looked at the picture and began to think it bore a resemblance. And eventually, in the late afternoon, around about 5.30, rang the police to tell them that he was concerned about a workmate called David Copeland. It was the first time David Copeland's name had been linked to the explosions. Unfortunately, it was too late. On the 17th of April, 1999, 22-year-old David Copeland embarked on a vicious spree across London. The nation's capital was rocked by two massive explosions over a period of just seven days. 61 people had been seriously injured. The police had several suspects identified and the race was on to catch the killer before he struck again. As teams rushed to gather what information they could on their potential perpetrator, one suspect, David Copeland, was already standing at the bar of the Admiral Duncan in central Soho. It's full of men, you know what I mean, all hugging up to each other and kissing each other. Indicate to me where you left the bomb. I went out to get a drink. Mm. And I don't slip it off my shoulder and put it on the floor. Around about 6.10, after standing there for some time, he said to a man near him, would you mind looking after my bag? I must get some cash. Can you tell me where the nearest cash point is? He then disappeared and left the pub. On the floor, inside the bag, the bomb ticked away. Now he had decided to attack a gay area. It was something he felt quite personally about. And he always seems to have had a, f a feeling since um, his teens that people thought he was gay when he wasn't gay. He had the clearest recollection that as a child, he watched the Flintstones TV cartoon program. And the theme tune included the words, you'll all have a gay old time, and he thought that he remembered his parents singing it, and they were effectively singing it at him as if they thought that he was gay. When he was selecting minority groups to target, maybe he had one reason for black people, maybe he had a, a similar reason for Asian people, each of them stealing his work, but maybe he had a special reason for gay people. This was really personal. In a later interview, Copeland would attempt to justify his deep-rooted homophobia. So how does the, the gay people fit in with your political beliefs then? Because they're different, you know, I mean, they're wrong, they're perverted, they're degenerates. At 6.30 p.m., the bomb exploded. This was a particularly vicious attack because it was left in a crowded bar where the effect of the explosion would be even more devastating than the other two attacks. The explosion didn't seem to spread out as you expected to. It almost selected which people to, to injure. There were people further back than me that were injured, and I wasn't. 74 people were seriously injured in the blast. Four would require amputations. Tragically, this time the blast was deadly enough to kill three people. John Light, Nick Moore, and a newly married Andrea Dykes were with a group standing close to the bag when it exploded. 
Andrea Dykes was four months pregnant at the time with her first child. By now, Copeland had returned to his hotel room to watch as the events unfolded on the news. He calmly left, boarded a train back to Farnborough and retreated to his room on Sunnybank Road. Across the country, individual police teams were frantically following up leads on the named individuals fitting the profile of the suspect caught on CCTV. Among those on the list was Copeland. They decided very late that night to send a team of flying squad officers down there. They surrounded uh, the house where he lived in a bedsit. And what they found was an extraordinary room decorated with a large swastika, pictures, cuttings from the first two bombs plastered on the wall. He almost readily admits that uh, he has been expecting them. He's the bomber working alone and it was as if it was just, um, he was waiting for it to happen. With Copeland under arrest, during interrogation, he freely admitted to his crimes. As you're aware, three people have died as a result of the, the device on Friday night. I feel nothing. I don't feel sadness, but I don't feel joy. I'm sorry for the woman and the child. I think the woman was pregnant. I feel sorry for her. But I don't feel no guilt for the others. He wanted to talk, he told us how he made the devices, why he did it, and it was driven by this part to being known. He, he believed in this Aryan state and uh, he was a racist. Copeland's intention was to start a race war. Copeland wanted a reaction from the very communities that he was targeting. He thought the minorities would rise up, particularly if they made the mistake of thinking that he wasn't alone, that he was part of a bigger group the worst lay ahead. He said to the police that he didn't really mind being arrested um, and going to trial because it was his little moment of fame. Before Copeland could be deemed fit to stand trial, assessments were made on the state of his mental health. Some believe that he showed very strong, florid symptoms of schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia, other psychiatrists thought there was more evidence there of long-term personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder, which is not a mental illness in the way that we would know it today. So lots of conflicting psychiatric evidence. Ultimately, it suggested that he was bad rather than mad and that he was going to face the full penalty for his crimes. The trial to convict Copeland of murder and causing explosions began on the 5th of June 2000. I remember coming in on the first day of that court case, court number one at the Old Bailey, perhaps the most famous courtroom in the world, and there in the rows were the victims, one or two in wheelchairs, others with obvious injuries, packed rows of people who'd suffered because of it. On the 30th of June 2000, having lasted only 19 days, the trial was brought to a close. Copeland was convicted of three counts of murder and three of causing explosions. He received six life sentences. Copeland was found guilty of the crimes he committed. Insanity was not a defence, and he will be detained for at least another 40 years. Whether he can be rehabilitated and made safe is something completely different. There's nothing wrong with him whatsoever other than he's a criminal, a terrorist and a killer. It was a, a feeling of relief, really, that they caught up with him and they got him. I don't think it ever completely goes away. It's always in the back of your mind somewhere and there is always going to be something that triggers it. He's a loner. He's the indefinable problem that police forces face. The undetectable attacker that can lurk somewhere out there. <laughs> 